Hi, I'm Nitin Baliga. I'm a professor at the Institute for Systems Biology. I also serve as the Senior Vice President and Director at the Institute. Systems biology is a discipline to study complex phenotypes of living systems. Living systems are essentially complex dynamical systems. So let me explain what complex systems are and then I will explain what systems biology does. So complex systems are essentially made up of many constituent parts. None of those parts on their own have the properties of the whole system. But when they come together, they give emergent behaviors. Let me give you an example. An airplane is a complex system. It is made up of many parts, the wing, the landing gear, fuselage. None of those parts on their own give the property of flight. But when they come together, you get this emergent phenomenon of the, of the ability to fly and all kinds of properties associated with that, like aerodynamics. Similarly, in biological systems, there are genomes that encode many genes. Even the simplest microorganism, a bacterium, can have thousands of genes in its genome. None of those genes individually can give properties of the whole system, but the genes work in complex networks to give very complex behaviors that are called phenotypes. So in systems biology, when we study a complex phenotype, we ask a question, and first we formulate a hypothesis. Based on the hypothesis, we then perturb the organism, and then we make measurements using powerful technologies, and these measurements are for all genes that are encoded in the genome. If necessary, we develop new technologies. This generates very large amounts of data. To analyze those data, we develop powerful computational algorithms, which allow us to then build predictive models of how they interact with each other in different contexts. We then simulate the behavior in a computer and we test our understanding by doing new experiments. And this iterative process of going from questions to doing experiments, applying technologies to measure large amounts of data, building models and testing the models with each cycle generates new insights, new technologies, new software capabilities, and in a sense, that revolutionizes biology. So systems biology is a departure from how biology has been done for decades. We used to use what was called a reductionist approach, where we would put a street lamp on the few genes that we think were important for the phenotype. But now we can look at all the genes at the same time. So that has revolutionized how we understand the phenomenon from a system scale to mechanistic detail, and furthermore, it also gives us the capability of making new discoveries and new hypotheses. My lab is working on projects that can be classified into three broad areas. First is the environment, the second is global health, and the third is personalized medicine. In the environmental arena, we are looking at problems that have been created by anthropogenic activities which is human activities that have changed the environment, such as climate change, for example, has shifted microbial populations in the environment, in soil, in oceans, and the communities in which they work. These shifts have caused major consequences on how nutrients are cycled around the planet. So we are trying to understand how these organisms function individually and together in networks. In the case of global health, we are working on diseases like tuberculosis, which is now being caused by strains that are resistant to antimicrobial therapy. We are trying to understand how these organisms gain resistance, and more importantly, how we can develop new drugs that are more effective at killing them. We're also developing point-of-care devices to diagnose patients, detect the pathogens, and make sure we can catch the infection early before it spreads. Finally, in the personalized medicine area, we are looking at diseases like cancers. We're trying to understand how patients are unique. Specifically, we are trying to understand what are the drivers of disease in an individual patient. So we can then do two things. One, we can predict the risk of the disease progression. And second, we can match them to therapies that are most likely to be effective on them. Cancer is a very complex disease. 
It's a heterogeneous disease. What I mean by that is the same type of cancer can be caused by dysfunction in many genes that act in very complex networks. So any given patient has very unique set of disease drivers that are responsible for the cancer. Not knowing what those drivers are is one of the primary reasons why therapies don't work on cancer patients as effectively as we would like. We developed an approach called Systems Genetics Network Analysis, or SIGNAL for short, which can help us figure out what are these networks that are responsible for a patient's disease. Using that knowledge, we can then do two things. We can predict what is the risk of disease progression in an individual patient, and second, Knowing the mechanisms responsible for the disease, we can then map drugs into those networks and then predict which drugs are likely to be more effective and which drugs are likely to be less effective. In that way, Signal allows us to personalize care plans for individual cancer patients. Infections caused by antimicrobial resistance strains of pathogens was responsible for killing about 2 million people in the last year. AMR strains are emerging for a variety of different diseases. Let's take tuberculosis, for example. TB caused by sensitive strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis can be cured in about 95% of all patients with a four-drug regimen given over a six-month period. When TB is caused by a multi-drug resistant strain of mycobacterium tuberculosis, about a dozen drugs are required to be given over a period of up to 30 months. That's about 15,000 pills. Even after this long period of treatment, only 56% of the patients are cured. It is projected that AMR associated infections would kill about 10 million people by the year 2050. So there's a desperate need of figuring out how pathogens gain resistance and develop drugs that are more effective at killing them before they gain resistance, and also to find drugs that are effective against AMR strains. There's a lot of work going on in figuring out how to do this. At the Institute for Systems Biology, with funding from NIAID and the Gates Foundation, we are developing powerful systems biology approaches that take advantage of machine learning and artificial intelligence to accelerate the discovery of novel drugs. Furthermore, we are also developing point-of-care devices that will allow us to detect the pathogen faster and also predict its response to drugs so we can be more effective in coming up with a treatment plan in getting rid of the infection before it gains resistance. We are facing existential threats with big events such as climate change and also with the emergence of antimicrobial resistant pathogens. To address this challenge, we need a well-trained workforce that is able to use the STEM disciplines to come up with innovative solutions. Unfortunately, even after getting high school education or even college education, most students are ill-prepared to join the scientific workforce. So STEM training has to be done more effectively. In fact, STEM skills are essential for our everyday life. They allow us to think critically about phenomena we observe, about information we get, and then evaluate what information is correct and incorrect. For effective STEM education, we have to develop new approaches to transferring knowledge to society from institutions like Institute for Systems Biology. To accelerate this transfer of knowledge, we have created a program called the Systems Education Experiences Program. This program is focused on taking new and current information and practices and transferring them to, to schools. And we do this through a partnership between students, teachers, and scientists. So we come up with effective curriculum modules that can be then disseminated through training of teachers and provided freely for dissemination across schools. We have developed over a dozen mo modules with this approach, and through the last 20 years, we have disseminated it worldwide. Our estimates are that millions of students are being impacted by the C modules every year. 
In fact, the, these modules have even been adopted as official curriculum in states such as California, and we're working with the state of Washington to now develop and disseminate a new module on systems medicine.